So before we even get going about flux and divergence and all those things, it's probably worth talking a little bit about what vector fields are. Regular scalar functions, well, they're pretty easy to deal with. They're basically something looking a bit like this, where you have different parameters, and if you put different numbers instead of these parameters, you'll get out some numerical, some scalar value as an answer. If you want to think of it in a more geometrical term, then maybe you can say that all of these parameters can somehow be points in some space. And you can say that each of the points in the space will be assigned a certain value, depending on what the function is. And that is basically a scalar function. But a vector function or a vector field is slightly different because rather than each of the individual points in space being assigned a certain value, they're instead assigned a certain vector. We can illustrate this a little bit like this. As you can see, each point in space will have some sort of a vector there, which will point in some certain direction and will have some certain size. That's basically what a vector is, something with direction and magnitude. You might see these graphs and it might remind you of things like graphs of wind flowing when you see on weather forecast. And so it's not really a surprise when you start to think of these vector fields as some sort of a flow of something of some sort. Now, I'll probably be using the words vector fields and vector functions almost interchangeably, and they'll mean the same thing. Usually, it's just whatever comes into my mind first at that particular moment. And when you start looking at vector fields in this way, maybe there is a couple of things that you might want to be able to calculate with these vector fields. One of the things is you might want to look at how much of this field passes through a certain area. The amount of flow through the area is very, very roughly just how much of this field goes through the area or how much of these vectors or field lines goes through the area. This here is a concept of something called flux. And then the natural question that follows is how do we even calculate these flux? Well, let's consider a simpler example first. Let's say we have a field which is basically just uniform or basically it's the same throughout whole space and we have a simple rectangular area like so. And we ask the question, what does the flux through this rectangle depend on? What factors affect how much of these vectors of this field go through the area that we have? Well, of course, one of the things would be the magnitude of the field that we have. If the field is stronger, then our vector will have a larger magnitude. That means there'll be more things sort of going through our rectangle. Another way that we can increase the flux is increase the area of our rectangle, because if there is much more of the rectangle, that means it'll be able to catch more of these field lines, and hence there should be more flux. And so we might conclude that flux can just simply be the magnitude of the field multiplied by the area that we have. Although this isn't quite always true. It's only true if the field that we have is perpendicular to the surface that we have. Another thing that will affect the amount of field lines through our rectangle, and it'll be a lot more subtle to think about, is the orientation of our rectangle. Because if our rectangle is massive but somehow is oriented like this, it's not going to catch any field lines. None of the field lines are going to be going through its area. Whereas if we rearrange it like such, then you know maximum field lines will go through it if you think about it. And so somehow if I draw a line out perpendicular to the area like this, we can say that the amount of flux will somehow also have to depend on this angle. We know that when this angle is zero, our area is facing directly at the vectors coming in towards it. So the flux should be maximum at this point. And when this angle is 90 degrees or is a right angle, the, all the vectors is just passing right through the front of it. And so none of the vectors would actually be going into the flux. And so it's somehow the flux should be zero at this case. So maybe the flux doesn't depend directly on the angle, but instead depends on some function involving the angle. Now to work out exactly how angle actually affects the amount of flux through an area, let's think of flux 
as something like rays of sunlight and the area just trying to block out the sunlight for example and flux maybe will just equal to how much of the sunlight is hitting on our area or how much of the sunlight the area is blocking if you want to think of it that way then if we were to have the area slanted like this it's actually no better than just having a smaller area but laying right perpendicular um, to the rays that's coming in. As you can see, it will block as much sunlight as each shudder. So we can call this new area that we just drawn some sort of an effective area of some sort, which I'll denote with a prime. And we can do a bit of geometry with it as well. Um, because if you do some geometry, you realize that this angle will also be equal to theta, the same as that. And then the effective area a prime or the size of a prime will just be equal to a cosine of theta as you can work out and so the flux that's going through our area will be the same as the flux that's going through our effective area and that will equal to the magnitude of our field multiplied by the size of our effective area that'll be equal to the magnitude of our field times the size of our actual area times cosine of theta. And so the value for flux does not depend directly on the angle theta, but instead depend on cosine of theta. And it will turn out that cosine theta will match the conditions that we want, because when theta is zero, we get the maximum flux. And when theta equals 90 degrees, we get no flux, which is exactly the conditions that we want as we have found. And so there, we have some rough idea of how to calculate flux now. You know, that flux will somehow be equal to the strength of the field multiplied by the area of our rectangle multiplied by the cosine of this angle between the area and the field itself. Now, for those of you who's a bit more familiar with vectors, you might realize that this looks somewhat like a dot product and in fact it is a dot product and we can represent a flux as a dot product. We can rewrite flux then as the dot product between the field and the area vector. Now area vectors will feel a bit strange to a lot of people but basically you can think of the area vector as having the magnitude equal to the size of the area and the direction it's pointing being perpendicular to the surface of the area itself. So for an area like this, its area vector will point something like this. And a larger area will have an area vector with a larger magnitude. And so there we have the way to work out the flux for a simple shape and in a simple field. But what if now we have a slightly different shape, which is no longer just a flat rectangular plane? And what if we have a field which is no longer constant everywhere? Now, if we were to estimate the flux through this whole area, a good way to do it is to just shop our surface that we have into smaller areas and then work out the flux for each of the individual areas that we have. Now, to find the flux, you'd have to find the dot product between the function that we have and the area vector of this area that we have. But the problem is the vector function that we have now will not actually be the same everywhere on the area that we have. So what we can do to estimate the amount of flux is to just pick the point maybe in the middle and use the vector function at that position to estimate the flux that we have to dot it with the area vector of ours. And if you want to work out the total flux, then you can just find the flux through each of the surface and add each of them all up. But again, if you want to get super, super accurate, then what you need to do is you need to divide the areas up into really, really, really small pieces, infinitesimally small areas. Then you can work out the flux of those individual areas that we have and then sum them all up. And if we're summing up infinitesimally small areas, that's basically an integral. And so that's basically what we have. If you want to find the flux through some strange area like this, then it's basically like finding the flux of each of these very small areas that we have, and then just sum it all up as an integral. It's the same thing as trying to find areas under 
a graph where we split the graphs into tiny rectangles and then sum them up in an integral. Basically, all of calculus, all of integration, is just dividing shapes into small areas and then summing them all up as an integral or an infinite sum. Note that to be mathematically correct, so we're actually adding in two integral signs. And the reason we're doing so is roughly we're trying to integrate over an area. So it's like integrating over two variables since denoting an area requires two variables. It's very hand-wavy arguments and there is more rigorous ways to explain it, but again, I'm just not bothered. Now, it's a point worth mentioning as well. Suppose that the area that we have is not just an open plane, but instead is a closed area. Or in other words, it actually encloses some certain volume. Then the way that we work out the flux is exactly the same. We can split this area again into smaller pieces as well. But the point that I want to mention is that when we have a closed area like this and we were to find the flux through this closed area, we can write this integral out with a special notation because rather than writing an integral out normally, we can add this little circle here to denote that we're integrating over a closed surface. Now it's also worth mentioning that when you have these closed areas, the surface, the small surface that makes up these areas will have area vectors that will be pointing outwards away from the shape. Which, if you think back to the equation for flux that we have, especially to the cosine term, it means that if the field lines that we have is actually going out away from the shape, it will mean that the flux will be a positive value. Whereas if the field lines are going into the shape that we have, then the flux that we have will be a negative value. And that's all due to the angle theta, which is the angle between the area vector pointing outwards and the field line, which might be pointing outwards or inwards, depending on what we have.